Hello and welcome to the UCL School of Slavonic and East European Studies new series, the CIS Knowledge Cafe, Conversations Without Discipline. I'm Claudia Rowland, the event manager for CIS. In this session of the series, the conversation will be between two of our newest CIS academics, Dr. Tomasz Wersheck and Dr. Jakob Benesch, who will be talking on nationalism. I'd like to introduce them briefly. Tomáš is an economist who joined CIS as a lecturer in June 2014 and has recently been promoted to Associate Professor of Economics. He has just completed a long-term research project into the origins of mass schooling in Central and Eastern Europe, for which he had a grant from the grant agency of the Czech Republic, as well as from Neuron, a private Czech foundation for the support of science. The culmination of this effort were not only a few articles in academic journals, but also a monograph like, titled Schooling Under Control, which came out this June. Anyone who has a copy and would like it to be signed should know Tomáš is very willing to do so. His research interests continue to revolve around the intersection of economic development, education and demographic change. Outside of his research, he enjoys music and plays the guitar, which he pursues as often as he can alongside childcare for his three children. Jakob Benesch joined CIS in September 2019 as a lecturer. As a postdoc at the University of Birmingham, he was employed on a major EU funded project that aimed to build an online platform for researching the First World War in transnational and comparative perspective. He's currently working on a book for Princeton University Press about East Central European peasants in the era of world wars. The main idea being to show how the peasant population of the Habsburg monarchy and its successor states shaped the unprecedented violence and political upheavals of this period. He particularly enjoys skiing, cycling and cooking in his free time. We've given them the broad topic of nationalism and we'll see where this conversation takes us. So thank you to our presenters, thank you to those watching and we hope you enjoy this celebration of interdisciplinarity. Off you go. Thank you for your welcome. Thank you. So, um, here we are talking about nationalism and uh, I guess the idea is or the, the, the intersection is we separately in our in our respective research cover two different centuries, neighboring centuries. Mine is mostly 19th century and you, you know, talking about peasantry during the, the two world wars, you know, that's basically a 20th century topic. But of course, nationalism is the other thin red line because the nationalism that develops in the 19th century in various ways, that's the force that ultimately blows up in everybody's face in, in the 20th century. And so, you know, um, the, the two centuries in this sense differ, I would say, in, in, in terms of how they value this whole national feeling, because in the 19th century, it still mostly has a sort of positive spin to it. But of course, the experience of the Second World War put a, a, you know, a serious damper on, on, the, on, especially in Central Europe, on national enthusiasm because, you know, because of all the damage that it can do. And so I, of course, you know, having studied um, education and schooling in this area, which is, you know, the Central and Eastern Europe in the 19th century, I, of course, think that, you know, a lot of the seeds of what comes in the 20th century is basically, uh, you know, sown already in, in that century before that. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, I find that that education, which usually gets such a positive press, you know, education is like the greatest thing since sliced bread. Education actually was, you know, one of the conduits in which that nationalism actually spread and, and in some sense intensified. I mean, you know, is that something that uh, you, you see the fruits of in in that in that twentieth century context when when you talk about uh, when you or when you study the, the the peasants and their role in that you know massive violence that takes place in the first part of the twentieth century? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, well, thanks for uh, uh, thanks for 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 getting us going, and thanks, Claudia, for for uh, putting this on. Um, yeah, I think I think uh, uh, maybe I'm not ready to sort of condemn education as the main culprit, but uh, but it's certainly a kind of uh, two sided coin, I'd say. And 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 uh, I, I worked on another project before my current project, which kind of spanned both centuries. Uh, uh, that was about uh, nationalism in the socialist labor movement of Habsburg Austria, and the socialists were, of course, very very interested in um, in promoting education and sort of creating new humans, new men, usually it's gendered. Uh, but uh, a big part of that was, of course, uh, educating people, creating enlightened new people, right? And 
uh, that worked to some extent. And I think the socialist movement uh, succeeded in kind of raising the uh, cultural level of the working classes as they indeed intended to do. But at the same time, um, increased nationalism was part of that. Uh, and it's hard to it's hard to kind of uh, judge the balance sheet, I think. Um, but maybe um, maybe uh, before we get to judging the balance sheet, maybe I could just ask you, Tomas, how you how you got into this project in the first place. Well, in, in some sense, that was you know the question that I sort of uh, implicitly posed uh, was was my was my initial motivation. You know, to what extent is education actually such a great thing? Uh, because as I say, you know, in lots of even modern analysis of, of development, social and economic, right, education features as like one of the greatest forces for good. And there is an obvious reason why it does, because education is where we go to acquire important skills. And those skills, of course, you know, um, are, can be a conduit to further, you know, developments. And even if you come with the most basic ones, which, of course, would be the the, the the primary aim of education, let's say in the 19th century, the skills like literacy, right, or, or numeracy, basic arithmetic, right? And so, you know, when you go from being illiterate to being literate and being, you know, having access to, to all the written resources of the world, that's a huge leap. And of course, you know, you can see how um, humans, you know, researchers would be, would be um, you know, singing praises to that massive return on that investment in a sense, right? You can go to school for a couple of years, you learn to read just a couple of letters and numbers. And before you know it, you know, your, the whole world is your oyster, you know, all the books, all the knowledge is, is in some sense, right? But the problem is, and this is something that I sort of write about in the book, is that historically education, especially when it gets into that mass phase, is public education. And so the state and the various sort of political constituencies that, you know, uh, govern the states, they have their own ideas about what the education should do. And so ultimately the education is not really just about skills. And sometimes it's not even primarily about the skills, but there's, that there's a huge amount of baggage that gets added to this, um, where, you know, the impact is actually not so obvious. So if I should, you know, take the particular example of the, uh, you know, ha the Habsburg schooling policy, which was, you know, the subject of my research, it actually turns out that, you know, yes, there are the, the, the three R's, you know, the, the trivial, uh, in the original sense, you know, the trivial subjects, uh, reading, writing, arithmetic, right? That's, that's, it's in the, it's in the syllabus. They are, they, they are called trivium, you know, the, the three-way knowledge, you know, the, because there are three, uh, you know, reading, writing, and arithmetic. And that gets included. But if you actually look at the syllabi, if you look at the timetables of these schools, a lot of that content is basically religious indoctrination. You know, and there is just a huge amount of time devoted to religion and regurgitating it and then, you know, reading it again. And, and then, of course, gradually also it becomes full of national histories. And so to some extent, you know, there is this education time or time spent in schooling which is not really used for the acquisition of productive, you know, useful skills, let's say, but it's in some sense even, you know, designed to close the mind, if you will, right? Again, there is, we, we do have the perception of education, you know, opening people's minds, you know, broadening their horizons. But think about it, if you have ideological schooling, uh, the school ultimately serves to educate you in a particular line, and you will get, you know, a, a given amount of, of, of information or knowledge, but also to, to, in some sense, inoculate you about outside influences. This is most obvious in religious schools, right? We want to make you a good Catholic or a good Protestant that would know our theology and would also be inoculated against, you know, the heresies of the other, right? And so in that sense, the education ultimately does not serve to open your mind, but to actually, in some sense, you know, close it. And uh, so, you know, when you discuss, for example, the 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 social democratic movement in the 19th century. I think this, you know, goes uh, to their credit. They they were actually probably ultimately the only force on the political landscape that in some sense actively stood against just, you know, using and abusing nationalism for their aim, right? The, it was part of their policy platform to say, you know, in some sense, nationalism is a, is a bourgeois sham and workers really are brothers across national borders because what unites them is their particular economic position. And so they were sort of a counterforce uh, 
originally against this. But ultimately, because they all went to primary school, they all read the textbooks, they all were subjected to this, that nationalism even invaded uh, these 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 social democratic parties, and so even you know ultimately the Austrian wide party splits into the individual national sections, right? That that's sort of the that's sort of the 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 influence that I see there, um, and you know that's probably what what you find in in, in your research, uh, you, know, you know when it comes to this. Uh, so, um, you know what uh, how the education ultimately pans out in its impact very much depends on. How it's structured and 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 what it's trying to achieve and uh, yeah how even you know coming to the most basic issues how the time is actually allocated right so your research basically deals with the the outcomes of this you know you you pick up with the people when I leave them right I, I sort of look at them in their in the you know at age six to twelve and then you look at them when they enter the market let's say become adults so where where does your research interest you know come into this where does it come from yeah, um, yeah. I think I think I think you could say that that there uh, 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 there is there is a sense in which sort of uh, you know seeds planted in, in in the period that you study kind of you know come uh, come out of the ground sprout up in in the period that I look at and it's it's not always a it's not always a pretty sight right and 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 education is is one of the most contentious fields in in late. Habsburg politics, the late period of the, of the Habsburg monarchy's existence, right? Um, sort of from the 1880s to to uh, the end of the First World War when the monarchy collapses. And um, yeah, as you say, uh, the ways in which education is structured um, can, you know, have some unexpected and uh, uh, sort of un unpleasant effects. Even the social democrats who propagate kind of international fraternity and cooperation fall victim, you could say, to nationalism with uh, this, this uh, all Austrian social democratic party. That is, it was a party for all uh, nationalities or, or peoples within Habsburg, Austria. Uh, it falls apart in 1911 with the Czechs, the Czech yeah. Social Democrats seceding uh, to form their own party. Uh, and and their, their dispute is primarily with their, their German comrades. And one of the key bones of contention is in fact uh, education. And it's not, it's not actually so much what is being taught in schools as how it's being taught and specifically the language in which it's being taught. So it's actually quite a banal issue that becomes really uh, the kind of, um, you know, the kind of Achilles heel of, of Habsburg uh, education, I think, in this in this period. And, and, and I think it raises questions kind of about sort of nationalism and schooling more general, you know, I mean, to what extent should bilingual education be provided to what, you know, when can a school be completely monolingual, even if it's not in the language that's officially of the state administration or something like this. And these these were really the key questions for for Czech and German uh, nationalists and ultimately for Czech and German socialists in, in Habsburg, Austria. So, um, uh, you know, the, the Czechs, as you know, they wanted instruction in Czech, uh, but they didn't have the same amount of resources as the German speakers, um, and they didn't have the same amount of support from the state administration for schooling in Czech. Uh, but the law uh, provided for them to have instruction in Czech if there were enough students. So there was all this, all this complicated politics around where people were living, and and if we can get more students, more more kids in one area, that we have sort of a meet the threshold to have a school in Czech and what if you know maybe the Germans aren't having enough kids and so there's all these questions of edu you know dem demographics and the Czechs are you know having too many kids and the Germans aren't having enough and 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 all the Germans will have to learn Czech soon which they don't want to and the Czechs don't want to learn German anymore and 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 this is an issue for decades and it sort of becomes becomes an issue that the socialists start to care very much about too uh, I argue in in the early, actually in the first decade of the of the twentieth century, when when the various um, uh, uh, socialist 
groups, or the, I, I should say the various uh, uh, national groups within the socialist movement decide that they're kind of the real leaders of their respective nations. And becoming the real leaders of their respective nations become means kind of taking over the issues that are most important to your nation. And that, you know, of course, is schooling. Uh, or one of the most important issues is definitely schooling. Uh, but I want to ask you, where where do you think it all went wrong with Habsburg education policy? Was it sort of was it kind of coded this this kind of flaw? Was was it coded in from the beginning, or was it something that happened as they went along, or um, you know could it have been avoided? So that's an interesting question, I think. And so uh, I actually think that to some extent the the answer lies in the countryside to a sense. And here is how, right? So one thing that is, I think, an initial design flaw is that the Austrian education from the beginning is fairly ideological in the broad sense of the word, right? So there is this idea that the curriculum must be infused with proper good values, which basically would mean, you know, being a good Catholic, being an obedient Catholic, a good peasant, and so on. And then, you know, we will also pack in some of those practical skills, such as the three R's, the reading, writing, arithmetic. Now, the school is actually not terribly useful uh, for, you know, the money that it costs, because you need to go there for six years. But especially the rural schools, they only have two grades of content. You know, there's the first grade, for, into which you go for two years, and then there is the second grade, which you do for four years. And it's repetitive and it's boring. And so the thing is, I find that the peasants in the 19th century are actually quite hard-nosed. They know that the school is not terribly you know, helpful or useful. And so uh, that's one of the reasons why the countryside is much more reluctant to take up schooling and to build schools and to finance them because they think, oh, this is all cost and no benefit. The government is not terribly uh, efficient in enforcing villages to build schools, but once a school is built, they are quite efficient in enforcing the curriculum, right? So you know that if you build the schools, they will give you that whole, you know, the set of textbooks and the trained teacher, and it's, you know, it's gonna be that, that ideological education that you're getting. And so the peasants, as I say, they are not falling for any kind of, you know, mumbo jumbo. That's that's just I. We, we're not going to pay for this if it's if it's not if it's not useful. Um, but when it comes to the language of instruction, of course, there are sort of two aspects to this. One is the practical one. You, of course, want to learn in your mother tongue because that makes for easier learning. This is this is not a big surprise, right? Of course, you want your child to ultimately be able to, you know, speak and learn and write your own language. Uh, and you know, even the children who show up at age six in the first grade. You know, you want them to understand what's going on, and so if the Czech children are exposed to to, to German learning, then you know, or German instruction, that's probably going to ultimately, you know, reduce the whole efficiency of the process. But then, language of instruction, as you said, is also a sort of nationalistic thing, right? It's a, it's a symbol of the identity. You know, this is what makes us Czech. This is what makes us German, right? That we speak this language and it's our mother tongue, uh, and so. This is gradually how that nationalist idea sort of uh, wheels its way into this. Uh, and of course, you know, there is uh, when when the, the fight between the nationalities really flares up in the late 19th century, a lot of it is, as you mentioned, about money, about, you know, population quotas, you know, do we have the 40 children within distance and, you know, who's going to pay for this? Is it going to be paid out of public money, out of private money? And so gradually, uh, sort of that 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 nationalism creeps in. So when you ask me, you know, is it a design flaw? Is was it inevitable, or you know, was it uh, something that came came from the outside? I, so there is one part that is, I think, there from the beginning. This experience that all the Habsburg subjects have that education is basically ideological, right? And unfortunately, ultimately, instead of fixing this part, you know, and sort of taking out the ideology and making it more practical. They basically just say, let's replace one ideology with another one. And so in some sense, instead of, you know, getting a thorough religious Catholic instruction, the reform of 1869 makes for a secular schooling. But it's and, you know, they do introduce some biology and some geography, you know, sort of uh, realia, you know, practical subjects that t t tell you something about the world. But at the same time, the nationalism starts infesting everything, even something so innocuous as physical education. Right. So, again, um, this is, you know, P.E. shows up on the roster in the timetables in the 1860s. And you could say, 
what is nationalistic about exercise? That's just, you know, people, you know, doing exercises. But it turns out, actually, that either of the nationalities, you know, they go through the primary schools, they, they, they do the exercises, they like the physical exercise, and then they continue with this by creating, you know, two different sort of uh, exercise organizations, the Czechs have Sokol and the Germans have a Turnverein, right, which are basically kind of like a gym membership, right? And it turns out that the, the gym membership, again, comes with a dose of nationalism and a very ardent nationalism, very sort of, in some sense, you could say the most virulent uh, intolerant kind of nationalism is, you know, this is the breeding ground for that, right? Uh, so that ultimately, by the time you get to the 1890s, and there are street fights between Czechs and Germans, who is participating, who is actually, you know, who are the fists, uh, you know, of these, uh, in these battles? It's it's the members of these little, you know, uh, organizations. And so that sort of tells you that, that the nationalism has this way throughout the 19th century of ultimately plugging, in, plugging itself into everything. And I think the fact that the Austrian education from day one was designed as, and was, was, was sort of, touted as or you know was 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 advertised as a great way to shape people's minds in a particular direction as opposed to just you know teaching them you know a few skills and then you go get on with your life you know that gets carried over and then it sort of um, you know uh, bears its bears its bears its fruit even in the countryside which as i said started from the sort of fairly hard-nosed practical uh, you know outlook but you know, you tell me if, or you know, if the peasants in any way are able to escape the nationalism that they ultimately, you know, imbibe in school just like everybody else. Yeah, not entirely, I'd say. Um, you know, uh, yeah, I think I think you know by the by the eve of the First World War, uh, certainly uh, nationalism and, and national education has has made its inroads. Quite successfully into the countryside as well. Although you know the countryside is still um, arguably uh, somewhat indifferent, and that's you know that's 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 a term that's been that's been used in a lot of recent scholarship about the, the Habsburg monarchy that the people um, whom we assumed who we assumed that were sort of already nationally conscious and mobilized and ready to kind of jump at the throats of people of the other nation were actually didn't. Didn't often care that much, and, um, and 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 you know there is something to that, particularly in, in rural areas, uh, particularly in kind of borderland mixed areas, and so and, and but that actually I think you know what what the recent scholarship on that subject has been right to to point out is that that uh, in fact intensified the, the the nationalist struggle over education, right? Because there was a risk of sort of losing your audience and losing people's, you know, interest, right? And so you had to be, you had to be extra uh, uh, sort of strident and extra loud basically to, to make sure that nobody can forget that they're going to a Czech school and that they're going to become Czechs. Because if you, if you drop your guard, who knows, maybe they'll sort of become Germans the next week because the German school is offering better lunches, right? And and it turns out that some of these people can actually speak German pretty well or speak Czech pretty well if they're Germans. And, and so there's this kind of, there's this sort of shifting uh, malleable population to an extent um, that 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 is uh, a very great concern to these nationalist activists. Now, um, that's, that's a story that's been told very well in some of the recent literature, and I think it does apply to the to the rural areas. As I said, I think there's you know we can risk overdoing it a little bit and and saying that you know seeing a little bit more indifference than there actually was. But um, but uh, yeah, if if you ask me about rural areas, I think that's something that needs to be needs to be taken into account. Certainly down to the First World War. Um, and yeah, and if I now start to speak a little bit about my new project, I mean, I think the First World War really changes things for the rural pop population. I mean, it changes things for everybody. And um, the evidence is quite clear that the rural areas didn't perhaps suffer as much as the urban areas during the war. Uh, in Central Europe, of course, you know, Germany and Austria-Hungary were, were allies and they were uh, subject to a blockade. Uh, by the by, the British in 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 particular, 
uh, that cut off imports. And so, you know, there was shortages in yeah. Central Europe that didn't exist uh, uh, elsewhere among the belligerent states. And, um, and those shortages hit all of Austria-Hungary's citizens. Um, and as I said, again, cities more than rural areas. However, however, the rural areas felt kind of victimized in a, in a way that they had never felt before. You know, the, the, the rural areas were sort of traditionally kind of more conservative, right? They were um, a little bit less touched by these nationalist movements. They were um, more keen on kind of uh, the God, you know, God and emperor, that, that sort of holy combination, right, for which they were mobilized to fight in, in, in 1914. And so kind of the shock of being subject to kind of uh, forced requisitions, you know, people, state officials going into rural areas and, and, and kind of collecting grain and other foodstuffs at, at, at gunpoint and um, church bells being confiscated to be melted down for, for um, uh, ammunition and, um, uh, and just shortages of draft animals and uh, able-bodied men who are sent to the front, right? So productivity kind of in, in the countryside, uh, uh, particularly actually in, in Bohemia and Moravia, uh, suffers terribly. The, the so-called Czech lands you know, uh, go from one of the most productive agricultural areas to um, uh, much less productive agricultural areas. And, and that, that sort of shock really um, imprints the countryside of Austria-Hungary, I think, very deeply. And that, that really, really gives rise to a very uh, a different kind of peasant outlook and, and politics uh, in the interwar period. It also produces a sort of paroxysm of violence actually in some areas as the as as the empire collapses not so much in in, in the Czech lands though there's a little bit of that but particularly in in um, uh, 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 what's today Croatia and Slovakia and southern Poland there's 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 a great deal of, of rural violence and so I'm kind of interested in 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 tracing that um, tracing the the effects of that through the interwar period and into the second world war uh, where I think they kind of resonated and sort of, um, you know, affected how the rural population dealt with a much more and even bloodier and, and more cataclysmic struggle. Uh, so, you know, in a sense, the peasants of Central Europe feel like they're still fighting the same war uh, into, into the Second World War. And it's not necessarily a war of ideologies. It's, it's kind of a war of them against... Uh, the urban urban power coming to take whatever they have and you know um, sort of take away their lifestyle and 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 change them beyond recognition. So um, I mean, if we go back to the question of nationalism, it's it's certainly uh, it's certainly there on peasants' minds uh, by the end of the by the end of the the, the Habsburg monarchy by the end of the First World War, um, but it's. It's a very kind of uh, it's 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 a very kind of peculiar type of nationalism because it's 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 it sees sort of uh, the rural areas as as the real heart of the nation and that you know the post-war order should be built around nations but nations of peasants right um, so that's yeah. but so when you describe this right so I see the starting point in in your description similar to mine that you know the peasants in some senses I say are, are somewhat hard nosed. You know, indifferent is a, you know, or, or, or immune to some extent to, to, to the shrillness of it, right? But then, you know, the way you describe the process is that, you know, they might not be interested in war, but war ends up being interested in them. And so, you know, they're sort of drawn into this, whether they like or not. And, but, but, you know, if the nationalism, you know, if they get bitten by the duck, I think what happens is that the nationalism sort of turns you from a reluctant participant into a sort of, you know, gung ho active part you know and of especially the nationalism in the first half of the 20th century that's that's the sort of you know aggressive kind of nationalism right which is very front and center very sort of you know let's go and get them um and so you know that would be my question you know does that does that virus ultimately get to them you know that that's sort of the, the most virulent strain of it 
uh, or is it that they are they always fighting basically a reactive defensive war? And if they f are fighting against the cities, is that really you know does the city country dividing line overlap with you know national dividing lines? You know, to to what extent is 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 that the case or not? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, to a certain extent, uh, uh, that uh, urban rural divide kind of gets gets uh, grafted onto um, onto the national divide, and and there's you know. As you know, there's there's sort of pre-existing conditions that that enable that because in in in, in a lot of East Central Europe, uh, not necessarily Bohemia so much by this point, but um, but certainly in, in in Moravia, in Croatia, Slovakia, the peasants around the towns are often of a different ethnicity or speaking a different language than the people in the town, right? So the town. Is is becomes foreign, uh, not just because it's 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 uh, uh, it's where the state of officialdom lives and where you know requisitioning parties are sent out, but because they're also speaking a different language or sometimes practicing a different religion. And you see, uh, as part of this paroxysm of violence, there's there's uh, anti-Jewish violence, right? And it's often perpetrated by kind of expeditions of peasants going from the countryside into the nearby market town, um, not usually cities because they're not strong enough to, to, to actually attack a city, but into the town, storming the town and, and you know, uh, uh, looting Jewish shops, sometimes amid great violence, uh, to take the uh, case of Southern Poland, for example. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that, you know, and I think, I think nationalism kind of aggravates these, these, uh, an this anti-urban sentiment right uh but it's also it's also the basis of this new kind of peasantist politics that we see between the wars uh particularly in in places like croatia and slovakia um i'd say again less so in the in in, in the czech lands but um the idea of the nation of peasants right uh is is um is i think okay it has roots before the first world war but it it, it gets a much kind of more aggressive edge uh, during the First World War. Um, I mean, it also, you know, it also gets a lot of a lot of uh, uh, new energy and it's not only violent negative energy. It's 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 also about peasants sort of mobilizing themselves politically for the first time and 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 kind of uh, creating cooperative organizations and advocating sort of investment in new agricultural techniques and things like that. So it's not you know, we can't say that that this sort of peasantist politics is is is, an, is just a sort of spasm of nationalism. But but nationalism is sort of it's hard to think about it without nationalism as an ingredient. I think. I mean, it seems to me that you know because this area is so diverse, you know, in various ways, one way to figure out to what extent the peasants, let's say, are anti-town, and to what extent the peasants are nationalist is to look at different cases where the local composition is different, right? So you might have, you know, Czech peasants around the German town of, of Svitavit, Svitav back then, right? Or around Jihlava, which was a German. But you might also have Czech peasants around the Czech city of Pilsen. And then you will have German pe peasants around the German city of, of Reichenberg, let's say, right? And so you have these sort of three different contexts where you can see, you know, here the ethnic divide exists on top of the urban rural divide. Here in this other case, it does not. And so it, th does that sort of make the, the conflict more salient in this respect? So I mean, it leads me to a question, which is sort of, you know, on the technical side. So what um, what are your, what are your sources? What, what you know, how do, how do you sort of go about figuring out uh, what these various peasants in? Because, you know, there are public statements, of course, you know, party programs and so on. Do we also, you know, is there other way to get inside their head, you know, uh, diaries or things like this? What, what, what is your evidentiary base, so to speak? Yeah, yeah, that's that's a really good question. Uh, it's the the peasant project has been more difficult source wise than the the project I did on on the socialist workers because um, because their educational level wasn't <laughs> wasn't wasn't quite the same, right? Uh, the socialist workers, at least the, the, the Czechs and Germans who comprise the majority of, 
of the uh, the Habsburg Austrian socialist movement. Uh, I mean, they're almost all literate, right? And they can not only read but also write, and and they're interested in re recording their their experiences. Uh, it's kind of the thing that everyone wants to do around the turn of the 20th century. It seems is start to record record their 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 own lives and experiences. So there was a lot of great kind of uh, ego documenta, you know, personal narratives that I could draw on for that. With the peasant project, it's 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 more difficult. I mean. Uh, there aren't so there isn't so much of that, um, and now I'm dealing not just with Czechs and Germans, but also with um, uh, Croatia, Slovakia, Poland, places that are historically uh, much less literate, right? Um, maybe for reasons that you can you can you can talk about, but uh, yeah, you know I'm I'm reliant a great deal on the sources created by the officialdom, by the authorities, right? When they report on what's going on in the countryside and they're very, they're of course very biased, right? And they think, um, uh, well, they think various things, but um, if the peasants start to get restless and, and angry, you know, they're not, they're not very sympathetic. <laughs> so, so, so you have to read between the lines a little bit. You have to, you know, read the sources against the grain, as, as we say in, in, in history often. Uh, and but you know some of these sort these these reports are very very detailed and so you know even if um, so they might actually record what people were saying at a particular meeting or, or during a certain violent ep episode and 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 that's you know very useful for kind of reconstructing what people what people wanted and what people thought who were who were involved even if they didn't themselves leave sort of written testimonies and you know and then they're brought sometimes before courts and sort of tried for various crimes or in, in investigated and and those court records are always very detailed and so you can kind of um you can again sort of try to reconstruct things there um this is not to say that there aren't any personal narratives there are some and they're very useful but um i'd say i'd say less uh this is yeah, I mean, maybe you could. I mean, your 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 project about schooling under control. It's 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 not just about Czechs and Germans. It's 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 about the Austrian, uh, or or even the Habsburg schooling policy in general, right? So so, so yes, I mean, I, I I mostly focused on the western part of the empire, right? So everything from let's say the port of Trieste, you know, through what today is Austria, into what today is Czech Republic, and into what today would be southern Poland and 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 western Ukraine, right? Um, and so yes, I cover all you know all kinds of nationalities. And uh, you know, as you mentioned, yeah, in some of these places, you know, the schooling infrastructure is is uh, very sparse. The people are illiterate. Uh, Dalmatia, for example, you know, had, had this perversely impressive record of being able to ignore the official regulation for a whole century. They just, you know, the, the, the law demands a school and they, they don't care. They just don't build it until 1890s, basically. And so, you know, in that sense, I have sometimes, you know, in, in many instances face the same problem as you do. How do you make the silent majority speak up, right? Um, and of course, you know, my particular approach is, is basically to look at statistics, which are aggregate, of course, but just like you know, every historical source has its ups and downs, or has its plus and minuses. And so, in statistics, you know, um, things need to add up, even numerically. Let's say, right? You know, like shares of population need to add up to a hundred, or you know, gender ratios need to be realistic, right? Because if if uh, babies are born, um, then you know, girls and boys are going to be roughly equal numbers. And then if you look at the school records and boys outnumber girls, you know, five to one, then you know that there is, you know, uh, something something fishy going on. Um, and so, you know, I'm basically trying to infer in that way in, in, in lots of places what the peasants must have been thinking by looking at the actions. You know, did they build a school? Did they build an extra classroom? Did they give the, the teacher a raise? You know, things like this. I actually am not present there, you know, I, and I, I nobody is probably going to ever find any minutes from such meetings. But clearly, you know, those meetings took place somewhere and the decisions were, 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 were made. And then what I do see ultimately is the record of the expenses for the school or, you know, the number of children who show up and, and, and things like this, right? Um, one example would be, uh, you know, how did the countryside, the people in the countryside decide about whether they will send their children to school? So conversations were had inside the families. What I do end up seeing is attendance records in a particular school where I have a name, 
father's occupation, the address of the child, age, and then, you know, the marks, whether they were in school on a particular day or not. And it turns out that, you know, when you then tabulate the results, for example, uh, by occupation of the father, you can see a very clear-cut social gradient, right? That if your father is a standalone farmer who's, you know, rich enough to produce for the market, your attendance is going to be relatively high. If you are an orphan, you only have a mother, not a father, or if your father is a cottager, that is to say, basically a subsistence farmer, then your attendance is going to be significantly lower. And of course, you know, that's coming back to, you know, peasants being kind of hard-nosed about it. They are weighing the pros and cons. And, and you know, the, the one of the pros of, of not sending kids to school is that they can work in the fields and, and, you know, support the family budget. And this is, of course, more salient in the poorer households than in the richer households, where, you know, the, the labor of the child does not really contribute much. And so, yeah, you can go to school, why not? Uh, and, the, you know, then there is, you know, the... How do uh, families treat daughters and sons differently, right? And so it turns out that, you know, in the villages, if I look at uh, boys and girls who are enrolled, they are on the roster, and then it's just a question of whether they show up, there is about 5% difference between boys and girls. So where is this coming from? Is it that the teachers discourage the girls, or is it, you know, is it that the parents, you know, discriminate between, between boys and girls? And so I look at families that have two children, one of, one of each kind, right? And so I can basically hold everything else constant and just control for the, the gender, right? Because, you know, if I if you, if you look at, you know, uh, daughters from one family and sons from another family, then there could be also difference in social status and so on. But if you have daughter and son within the same family, they have the same father, same address, same everything, the only difference between them is, is gender. And if I still see that 5% difference, which I do, it basically tells me that this was something that's happening deeply inside family, where the fathers presumably said, you know, the girl can stay at home and the boy will go, right, uh, to some extent. So um, that's that's the that's that's the the, the technical side of, of of research that I sort of deal with, right? They're trying to make the get under the skin of the numbers and figure out what what's going on there, basically in the background. And do you do you see a difference between urban and rural areas? A huge uh, in terms of Gender, yeah. So uh, the 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 difference between urban and rural areas partly was written into the law, and then the economic development in the background actually, you know, even amplified these differences. And so by the time we get to the mid nineteenth century, uh, you know, there is there is a, a sort of liberalizing, secularizing school reform in eighteen sixty nine, which for the first time allows for private schools to be established. And what happens is that in the cities, this just explodes, right? They, they go from nothing to, to you know, having, uh, the bigger the city, the more private schools you have. They just, they, they are hungry for this. And the countryside, they cannot even meet the, 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 the threshold set by the law as to how much schooling should be, should be offered, right? So there is this big difference uh, be between uh, between uh, the two uh, the two areas, and when it comes to gender divide, again, the private schools in the cities actually very frequently cater specifically to girls, right? Uh, whereas in the countryside, you know, it's it's it, you know this is uh, that's where that's where the difference basically is more pronounced, right? Yeah, I mean, one thing that that, that strikes me uh, uh, that I'd like to ask you. Uh, I mean, you're a historian, but you're also an economist, and I wonder, yeah. you know, you're 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 very attuned to also sort of the the bigger economic picture. And I wanted to ask you, sort of maybe provocatively, wasn't nationalism uh, or the spread of nationalism actually good for the economy? Well, so the Czechs in particular would on the first at first glance, look like the perfect poster boys for an answer in the affirmative, you know, because you, you look at the Czechs in 1800 and then in 1900 and you compare, you know, how rich they are, how educated they are, how literate they are, uh, what sort of sectors they work in, uh, what's their cultural output, let's say. And in all these respects, the Czechs are winning across the board, right? By the end of the 19th century, there is a Czech university and a, a Czech polytechnic and, and an, uh, you know, a lively uh, sort of newspaper market, you know, and, and a full range of political parties, you know. So in some sense, the nation matures immensely within that span of one century. 
And so one might be tempted to say, see that 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 uh, that fervor of, of for that that, that uh, great enthusiasm for national identity, you know, that uh, that drive to to make the nation great again. <laughs> Forgive me the the phrase. Uh, you know, that isn't that you know a, a great force for the development here. But at the same time, I'm asking uh, all of these things that I mentioned. To what extent was really nationalism in particular the key ingredient, right? So when I say that the peasants are are hard nosed in the countryside, you know, about building a school, that basically means they look at the school as basic as you know very instrumentally. Does it get me something that I could use? You know, um, by the late nineteenth century, more and more the answer turns out to be yes because the economy gets more sophisticated, more complicated. You know the the sort of easy industries, uh, easy in terms of skill required, like textiles and and paper making, make way for uh, sugar refining and brewing and electricity comes in. Right, suddenly you need to actually be able to read uh, and to understand blueprints and things like this. And so suddenly even the peasants think, let's send the kid to school because then you know he or she will be better able to you know uh, make themselves useful in the local sugar refinery. Um, and so there you see that here the motivation still does not need to be strictly speaking nationalistic. It still could be about you know the dollars and cents in some sense, right? Is the war, is the school actually useful, right? And so I I see that that massive you know successful development of of the Czech national polity during the 19th century. I also see this intensifying nationalism, and so the the correlation is positive. But is the nationalism causal to this? You know, is it like the the, the secret sauce? There, I'm much more skeptical because uh, you know, a lot of the the upswing, a lot of that development is is perfectly explainable from from um, incentives or motivations that are not primarily nationalistic. You know, just you just the the basic human desire to sort of get ahead in life, of whatever nationality you might be, but get ahead. Uh, you know that's that's enough to to get me the results. I mean, what what is what is your um, view on this? Well, how, where do you stand on this? Well, I uh, yeah, I'm not I'm not entirely sure where I stand, but I I think yeah, I think uh, it's unlikely to be a coincidence that the most intense, the fiercest nationalist conflict in in the late Habsburg monarchy, uh, that is between uh, the Czechs. And the Germans erupts precisely between the two most uh, economically prosperous and educated um, educated peoples, right? So, yeah, again, I mean, there's clearly a correlation. Whether it's whether it's causal, however, I guess is is another question. I mean, it might be a sort of chicken and egg sort of thing, you know, which which comes first, and and it's kind of you know analytically very difficult to very difficult to answer. Um, you know, I, I, I think the education uh, that Czechs had and that, that Germans had in Bohemia certainly certainly enhanced that what you call basic human desire to kind of get ahead in life, right? I mean, that certainly kind of broadened their, their horizons and let them, uh, uh, prepared them to kind of um, uh, do things like take out loans from savings and loans banks and try to, you know, improve their businesses or establish kind of uh, entrepreneurial uh, concerns and, you know, um, things like that, right? Uh, I, you know, you see, you, you look at sort of more backward parts of the monarchy, more kind of peasant uh, economies, and, and there's, there's much, much less of that, and there's also much less education. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, so I was recently, you know, uh, I came across this interesting uh, observation, which is from the opposite end of Europe. Apparently in 19th century, the population of Ireland en masse abandoned the Irish language and started speaking English in large numbers. And Ireland still ended up being, you know, poor at the end. And in fact, the English was a conduit for many of the Irishmen to basically leave and go to America. And to some extent, this was their motivation, right? And so um, 
you know, that would in some sense be a case against my argument. Like, so here you have it, right? Maybe if they actually did invest in the national identity more, then the the the, the strength of Ireland would not be sapped as strongly. You know, the best and the brightest would not have left for the, uh, you know, for for the American shores, and then you know, more domestic development would have taken place. Um, but uh, you know, as I say, the, the uh, what I what I'm missing in the, or what I would need to to have a, a sort of more positive or you know to give it to give it more credence to nationalism in, in in the whole argument is a more direct link from not just you know being Czech and being literate in Czech but being sort of proudly Czech to then you know economic like if we could find that you know people who are more uh, nationally aware are more eager to start a business and succeed in it then I think you have a case to make right uh, but I, I am not sure that this actually is, uh, you know, the historical uh, the historical reality. Uh, in fact, you know, precisely because the nationalism ultimately ends up invading everything, including finance, which is yeah, something yeah. ridiculous, right? Yeah. Uh, that can be a very much a source of inefficiency when you end up, you know, discriminating between your customers and, you know, discriminating between your suppliers. And, you know, you, that, that's beca that becomes sort of economically costly in, in a way, right? Uh, yeah. So uh, I I I am leaning more towards seeing nationalism as more of a wedge issue as opposed to a you know a, a, an engine for anything you know uh, positive. Um, yeah, actually, I mean, to, I think to back that up somewhat, uh, I could I could draw on my own research about the the socialist movement and and once the socialists start to care about proving their their kind of national authenticity and their national credentials well then they were very keen to point out that you know the the bourgeois class the the industrial class wasn't nearly as national as they claimed to be because um they were they were only interested in in, in money said the socialists right we're we're actually we're sort of you know salt of the earth good hard-working people who 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 care about being czech or german or whatever but um you know um uh, uh, the 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 uh, factory owner over there, you know, he doesn't he doesn't actually, you know, he may invest a little bit in the Sokol uh, uh, organization, but he actually doesn't care about the Czech nation at all because he sends his kids to a German school and you know plays plays cards at the Deutsches Casino or the sort of local you know right. center of German uh, sociability, middle class and upper class German sociability, and so so yeah, I think I mean. Certainly, the socialist perspective uh, from the early 20th century would would kind of corroborate your <laughs> your take on this. I think um, that, that 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 nationalism and money didn't always kind of go together. Of course, you know, you and I both, you know, we live in 2020, so we are on the other side of the Second World War, and I think you know the, that that conflict, which was clearly a conflict of of, of uh, intense and rabid nationalism. Uh, you know, you know, cast its long shadow. I, I think with some justification. Um, and so, you know, anytime we look back into the 19th century, it sort of always comes through that lens, a lens of of basically this this thoroughly catastrophic experience with nationalism that uh, that sort of takes place in the first part of the 20th century. Uh, the 19th century, uh, you know, contemporaries, of course, had a much, uh, much, much rosier view of, of the whole national sentiment and what, what, uh, how much an inspiration it could, could be. But as I say, you know, I, um, what is, how big is really the value added of that? It, I think that's yeah. you know, maybe difficult to estimate but my hunch, and okay, it's it's let's say not more than a hunch, is that the the estimate ultimately would not be very high. You know that it doesn't add all that much. Yeah, I would I would agree with you. I think you know the yeah absolutely the 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 experience of the Second World War has 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 made us very very uh, uh, cautious and and rightly so about kind of finding um, you know progressive or or positive potential in kind of nationalist movements and nationalist policy. Uh, um, but yeah, it definitely looked different around the turn of the 20th century and some of the, some of the most, um, kind of brilliant social theorists that the Habsburg monarchy produced, um, kind of socialist thinkers like, uh, Otto Bauer and Karl Renner and also, and Bohumir Schmeral on the Czech side, um, really thought that, uh, sort of working class 
politics and, and internationalism could kind of go hand in hand with with kind of heightened national consciousness and national pride and, you know, enhancing national identity and things like that. You know, they thought that uh, if it were properly managed, and of course there was never an opportunity to kind of properly manage it, that nationalism was actually sort of the way in which the poor of the of of society uh, could improve their, you know, improve their 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 social cultural standing, right? That they could actually kind of take take a sort of sense of pride in who they are, and 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 that there is a kind of democratic logic to this. You know, once you become aware of your place in the nation, then you're more concerned about sort of society as a whole and you vote and you vote progressively and of course socialist and and that's a great thing um we didn't really have a chance to to try that out but uh <laughs> it was it makes for interesting reading today at least yeah but i would say that yeah to some extent you know the subsequent development showed that this promise did not quite materialized, you know, that these hopes were, were disappointed, that, you know, um, I presumably there could be, you know, something uplifting in, in uh, you know, uh, supporting one's national identity and all that. But uh, as it actually happened, it usually, uh, or ultimately in the 20th century, were the, the more baser appeals that basically won the day, right? And well, so, big, right. yeah, I mean, a big, a big part of their a big part of their thinking was the assumption that you could separate actually the economics of nationalism from the kind of cultural personal side of national identity so that you know you could you could have your 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 Czech symphonies and Czech sort of organizations and singing and nature societies and whatever and that would be kind of what you do in your free time but then you know people would all sort of find common cause when it comes to uh, making everybody prosperous and running the state as efficiently as possible. And uh, in reality, of course, it was very difficult to, to think how that could actually uh, be done, let alone, let alone actually do it. Um, yeah. Well, you know, to sort of, you know, bring this all the way to into the 20th, 21st century, and that presumably is where we need to sort of stop because we don't know what the future is going to bring. You know, today when, of course, you know, the nation states are still in great, in, in uh, majority sense, you know, the, the organizing units of, let's say, the European political landscape, um, the, the nationalism that exists, let's say, in the Czech Republic or, or you know, the, you know I, I find myself more comfortable in that uh, situation where you know that that uh, shrill nationalism of the 19th century has been corrected by that you know realization how damaging it can be and so today you know i think we have by and large a sort of manageable middle where you know the national identity is acknowledged and it's developed you know Czechs are still doing great but that 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 sort of merciless intolerant rabidness is is sort of not part of it and so you know that's that's the position that I that I can live with that, that I'm sort of fine with. Uh, I, I hope that it will sort of stick around for for a long time. Well, that's a, that's an optimistic note for us to finish our, our our conversation on. I don't I don't necessarily want to want to um, sour the mood. I don't <laughs> I don't I don't have any information to the contrary really either. Um, Although, you know, I mean, the Czechs have to, yeah, the Czechs are, are still prospering and, and they, have a, uh, they have a sense of, um, they have a sense of themselves as being um, able to kind of celebrate Czechness, but keep it maybe within bounds, at least for the most part. And, yeah. you know, uh, it, it, you know, the same goes for some other Central European countries, maybe not Maybe not all entirely, but um, but yeah, I mean, maybe it took the sort of the the, the extreme violence of the Second World War to learn that lesson. Uh, now, now you have the challenge of a supranational um, European Union, right? And 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 where does where does sort of Czech 
or any other national identity fit within that? Well, you know, they coexist. Uh, there is some sparring, but as I say, it's a sort of low level, uh, not even a conflict, just, you know, low level skirmishing, if, if I should call it that. Um, uh, so I'm not terribly worried that it would sort of, you know, blow up in everybody's face just like it did a hundred years ago. And so I say, you know, that's thank partly thanks thanks to the fact that the the shrillness, at least to the Czech nationalism, that has been taken out. And I think that that's that's, you know, let, let's hope that it stays that way. On that note, thank you very much. It sounds like this is a conversation that could continue um, off screen. So we look forward to that. Just want to say thank you to both of you. Thank you to all of our speakers throughout the series. Um, we hope that the audience has enjoyed it and we hope to bring you another series soon. So thank you very much for watching and hope to see you at another event soon. All right, thank you too. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Claudia.